everyone, and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today, we're discussing Fired Hitman Fails. Let's get into it. Valerie McDaniel and Leon Jacob 48-year-old Valerie McDaniel seemed to have it all. She was a veterinarian with a successful practice in Houston, Texas. She split her time between her beach house on Tiki Island near Galveston, and she was often surrounded by friends who described her as a spirited individual that was caring, but miserable. Despite the appearance of bliss, Valerie was experiencing decades of loneliness and heartbreak. She had recently separated from her husband of nearly two decades, Marion or Mac McDaniel III, a man who she discovered had almost never been faithful to her. He was often away, leaving her to deal with their business and child alone. He would go on extended hunting trips and vacations with his friends. One day while at work, a woman called her at the clinic and gave her lists and lists of women that her husband had been seeing over the years with photographs, emails, and text messages to prove it. After that, Valerie filed for divorce. To make matters worse, she now had to share custody with their 9-year-old daughter in 50-50 split and recently had been required to buy out her ex-husband from her veterinary practice for a total of $1.25 million. Her husband had cheated his way out of their marriage and got rich doing it. It was enough to make Valerie bitter and angry towards her ex. Though her friends stated they never saw her lose her cool and never could have imagined what would come next. In 2017, Valerie's neighbor introduced her to her 39-year-old son, Leon Jacobs. Jacobs said he was a doctor specializing in transplant surgeries. The two didn't immediately hit it off, but Leon pursued Valerie relentlessly, and she finally agreed to go out with him. From there, the two did hit it off. Valerie and Leon had a whirlwind romance, and after only weeks of dating, he had moved into Valerie's condo. Valerie told friends that she'd never been loved like this ever, and she said that being with Leon was incredibly passionate and romantic. But her friends had reservations about Leon Jacobs. Though charming, they found him to have a huge ego, he was arrogant and incredibly self-centered and materialistic. They expressed their concerns about the relationship, but Valerie didn't want to hear it. Soon, the two were talking about marriage. Valerie had no idea about Leon Jacob's checkered past. He was the son of very successful divorce attorneys. He'd grown up in affluent neighborhoods in the best schools with the best opportunities and anything he could have ever wanted. He went to med school in 2005 in the Caribbean island of Granada. From there, he came back to the U.S. to start his residency program in Texas but was dropped. After that, he moved to Ohio and entered another residency program, but was terminated as well when his supervisor discovered he had lied about patient care and stated that he lacked the medical knowledge required to practice medicine. In 2012, he was arrested and accused of burglarizing the home of a hospital administrator in Ohio. Again, he pleaded down to a misdemeanor of criminal trespass. No explanation was given as to what he was doing there or why he was breaking into that home. Jacobs had been married for 11 years and his wife had filed for divorce in 2013, citing abuse. After her filing, she also needed to get a protective order against Jacobs for stalking and intimidation. There had been emails, texts, voicemails with Jacobs threatening bodily harm if she didn't take him back. He was charged with aggravated stalking and intimidation, but pleaded down to cyber stalking and the other charges were dismissed. By 2016, Jacobs found himself unhirable and broke, eventually filing for bankruptcy. He eventually moved back to Houston where his parents lived. There, he met a woman named Megan and the two began dating, but it wasn't long before that relationship also ended in criminal charges. In 2017, Megan called the police for domestic violence. Her lip was split, and she said that Jacobs had grabbed her face violently during an argument. She ended the relationship and pressed charges against him, but that was only the beginning. Like with his ex-wife, he started stalking her, calling her incessantly, and wouldn't leave her alone. 
The assault charges were eventually dropped due to insufficient evidence, but there was enough evidence for a felony stalking charge, and Megan wasn't dropping it. It was a criminal case that he wasn't likely to win. Due to the criminal charges, Leon Jacobs was now ineligible to acquire a medical license in Texas with a felony. While Jacobs was dealing with his legal issues, Valerie was also having legal troubles. She wanted primary custody of her daughter, and her ex-husband was fighting it, leading to a contentious custody battle. And one day, Jacobs came to her with a solution to both of their problems. A man he knew, named Motaz Aza, was going to take care of their issues. Aza was an ex-military buddy of Jacob's, and for $5,000, two Cartier watches, and a MacBook, he was willing to take out Megan and Mac. Jacob's gave his buddy a deposit of $9,000, and then Aza disappeared. When he disappeared with his money, Jacob's reached out to a mutual acquaintance and revealed to him that Aza had stolen his money. When asked why Jacobs had given him the money, Jacobs revealed enough information to draw concern, and that acquaintance called law enforcement, believing Megan might be in danger. Police had been able to locate Aza and arrested him, and in order to avoid criminal charges himself, he was offered immunity to tell them what Jacobs had planned for his ex, and he took the deal. Law enforcement decided to set up a sting operation, which first involved protecting the potential targets in case someone else had been hired, and then Aza was sent in along with an undercover cop to meet with Jacobs and Valerie to discuss the murder-for-hire plot. The four met at an olive garden, sharing a booth in the corner. Valerie showed up having just left work, still wearing scrubs with her name embroidered on the chest. Jacobs orchestrated the conversation, careful to use broad language, but it was clear who was the driving force behind the plot. Between the unlimited salads and breadsticks, Jacobs revealed that he wanted Megan kidnapped and injected with potassium chloride to stop her heart and left to be found somewhere. For Mac, they felt a robbery gone wrong would be the best, at his home, when he didn't have their daughter. They would get the rest of the payment after the murders were carried out. Once that money was sent, they could both be arrested. Law enforcement arranged the fake deaths of the victims posing them and setting crime scenes and taking detailed photographs. The evidence was sent and the final payment was made. When law enforcement showed up at Valerie's condo to deliver the death notice, when actuality, Mac was in his car in the parking lot waiting to pick up his daughter once they were arrested. Law enforcement started by saying that Mac had been murdered, but then yelled, cut, and started reading them their Miranda rights, informing the two that they would be arrested for attempting to solicit capital murder. Sir, when Miss McDaniel emerged from the jail's processing center here about an hour ago, a group of energetic reporters, of course, pursued her for comment, but she did not seem to be in a conversational mood. Why would you want your ex-husband killed? Out of jail on bail, but certainly not out of hot water, 48-year-old Valerie McDaniel, a successful Montrose veterinarian, has a starring role in a sordid tale. Normally it's more of a, I guess, a high society crime in the fact that they're the ones who can afford to have people killed. Police say McDaniel and 39-year-old Leon Jacob, who Channel 2 has learned has been pretending to be a licensed doctor, plotted to kill their exes, say investigators, but the plan went south when they hired an undercover cop to carry out the murders. I would say as far as going to the extent of making somebody up, pretending like they're killed, taking them pictures, this is not something we have not done before. That's right, the would-be victims posed for fake crime scene photos. In McDaniel's case, her ex-husband, who Channel 2 has learned was in a custody dispute with McDaniel's, something his family wasn't ready to discuss Monday. No comment. Okay. okay. We do know McDaniel's co-defendant, 39-year-old Leon Jacob, was already accused of assaulting and stalking his ex-girlfriend when police say he initiated the plan to have her killed. And police say those plans with the fake hitman were cemented over breadsticks at a nearby olive garden. Both of the co-defendants have a court date in just a few weeks. It looks like Mr. Jacob will remain in jail until then. We're live downtown. I'm Joel Eisenbaum, KPRC.
They were arrested on March 10th, 2017 and charged. Valerie was able to make bond and was released, but only days later, she jumped off her seventh floor balcony, committing suicide, leaving Leon Jacobs to head to trial alone. Jacobs' trial began a year later. He took to the stand, maintaining innocence despite recorded calls, audio recordings from the Olive Garden meeting, money exchanges, and testimony from Azah. The jury ultimately found him guilty and convicted him on two counts of solicitation of capital murder. Megan provided this victim impact statement during sentencing. You convinced me to leave my life I had in Pittsburgh, and you convinced me it was awful. You manipulated me to leave my family and the life I had. I believe everything happens for a reason. While you sit in jail, I hope you think of me, the girl that you called poor and uneducated. Because it's because of me, you will be in prison for life. You will never see your children grow up. You will not be a part of their lives, and they will be better for it. I think some part of me always knew that you would try to hurt me, and that you were always lying. The realization that your family also knew you were lying made it even harder to face this. You destroyed me financially and took away my sense of security, but you can do that no more. Enjoy life in prison. And he was given 30 years in prison for the involvement of trying to have her and Mac McDaniels killed. Assam Ahmed Aid. It was the summer of 2006 when 51-year-old Assam Ahmed Aid was sick of his job. He worked as a poker dealer at the Bellagio Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Aid, originally from Egypt, seemed to be living a normal life. He had a home in Vegas. He lived there with his wife and his daughter. Those who knew him said that he was nice and never expected what was to come next. Aid hired a Florida web designer to build a crude website, hitmenforhire.net, which boasted, quote, assassinations are the most practical solution to common problems. Thanks to the internet, ordering a hit has never been easier. We manage a network of freelance assassins available to kill at a moment's notice. On the site, he used the alias Tony Luciano and waited for clients to reach out. That client was 23-year-old Marissa Mark, who did just that. Mark was from Pennsylvania and a recent college graduate, and she wasn't happy that her boyfriend had broken up with her, and worse, that he'd found someone else. Via email, she told Aid that she wanted her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend killed. Specifically, she wanted her shot in the head. And Aid offered to complete the job for $37,000. Mark, who worked for a collection agency, stole three credit cards from clients and secured half the funds to go towards a deposit. Mark sent over photographs of the victim, mostly collected from her MySpace page, as well as information about her place of employment, among other details. Aid then hopped in his car and started the drive for LA, where the victim lived. Once there, he approached the victim at her place of work and presented her with a folder of all the emails, photos, and paperwork about her life. He told her that a bad person wanted her dead, but he said she reminded him of his daughter and wanted to extend an opportunity to save her life. All she needed to do was pay the remaining balance of the contract, $20,000. He said that she had three days to come up with the cash or he would be back. He then gave her his real name and real phone number to contact him and she went to the police. The victim, with the assistance of the FBI, attempted to trap Aid. The victim called him to ask for more time to get the money together, but during the call also asked if he got the money from another source. How would she know if there was another hit placed out on her if someone wanted her dead? They needed to know who hired Aid. He attempted to reassure her, saying, quote, only 700 people in the world work as hitmen, and my father, Michael Luciano, is a boss over all of them. If any of them got a contract on you, my father would know, and therefore, so would you. Over the next few days, Aid and his partner in crime slash girlfriend would call the victim multiple times, repeating the demands for more money. 
the FBI instructed the victim each time to ask for more time to come up with the cash, which Aid would agree to. The victim never followed through with the money, nor did Aid follow through with the murder. Instead, when law enforcement went to arrest him, they discovered that he'd left the country. But it didn't appear that they knew they had been caught, as they didn't fly back to Egypt, where there was no extradition agreement with the U.S. Instead, flight records showed they flew to Ireland. Meanwhile, law enforcement searched Aid's home. On his computer, they found everything his email correspondence, Google searches for how to make silencers from household objects, where to buy cyanide, and then how to make ricin. In his emails, they discovered why they'd gone to Ireland. He'd been communicating with a wife who wanted her boyfriend and his two sons killed so that she might inherit his vast real estate fortune. She had forged a marriage certificate online. All that was left was the murder. She forwarded as much information as she could to Aid, who she believed was Luciano. In her emails, she gave herself the nickname Lying Eyes and gave Aid $23,000 as a portion of her deposit. When Aid arrived in Ireland, he decided to attempt the same swindle as the California client. He approached one of the victims, PJ Howard's oldest son, and told him that a bad person wanted him, his brother, and his father dead. All they had to do was pay off the contract for 100,000 euros, or about $158,000 USD. Aida and his girlfriend were swiftly arrested in Ireland, as well as Lying Eyes, whose name was revealed to be Sharon Collins. The UK authorities discovered that Collins had paid for Aida's hotel with Howard's credit card. With the help of U.S. counterparts, they had all the email communications between the two and were able to charge Collins and Aid with attempt to solicit murder for hire. Aid was held in custody while he awaited trial. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison in Ireland for extortion. Once he finished his sentence in Ireland, he was extradited back to the U.S. for his involvement in Marissa Mark's attempt to have her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend killed. He pleaded guilty, and he was given three years on extortion charges. His girlfriend was sentenced to eight months for her involvement in the murder plots. On the U.S. side of things, Marissa Mark was arrested for attempting to solicit a hitman. She was given six years in prison and was also extradited to Trinidad as she was in the U.S. on a student visa. Sharon Collins was also given a six-year prison sentence. Aid isn't believed to have murdered anyone and may have pivoted to extortion because he would never had any intention of killing. He was released from prison in 2013 at 58 years old. His criminal career seems to have ended as swiftly as it began. Well, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Other ways to support the channel are by joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch and you will find all the links in the description plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more, and more recently, Twitch. But with that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It is very appreciated. That's it for me. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you.